Elizabeth, you don't you don't say you don't say it in precisely those same words, but you invoke uh, the uh, a similar sentiment of the the need for an explicit addressing of the issues that are faced by African Americans. How important is this this notion of of separating, as what I think is Michael is suggesting, is separating the idea that that the government needs to do things that help all people, and along with that will come minorities and, and anyone else who, who, who faces difficulty, uh, and this idea that, no, we've got to stop doing it that way, stop saying it that way, that seemed peaceable in the past, but we have to be willing to say explicitly that this is a specific terrible thing faced by this one group of people, and it needs to be acknowledged as a different thing and addressed. And I think you do say that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, building off of some of the comments that Hillary Clinton's made, I think it's promising that she's able to use the, these these staggering figures about racial inequality and say, the Schomburg Center announced when the CBC endorsed her, that she wants to make ending inequality, she doesn't say racial inequality, she says making ending inequality the mission of her presidency, which is promising. However, American inequality is not going to end until we really confront head on racism and the historical legacies of enslavement. And I think that is, is part of what Professor Dyson's talking about, that we need to explicitly, because Slavery was racially targeted. We're still dealing with the impact of slavery today. It has seeped into not only our policies, not only the ways in which we allocate resources, but the worldview of many Americans. We have to deal with, with those legacies and the, the ways in which African Americans since emancipation have been structurally prevented from really being able to come up with their own solutions to the problems facing their communities. And that's part of what my recommendation was about, that we return to some of the more transformative aspects of the war on poverty, the notion of maximum feasible participation, where the federal government was empowering community groups to solve their own problems on their own terms. But when you say that, the, that there should be uh, the availability of resources for these communities to then decide for themselves how to resolve the, some, of, some of their issues or address some of the issues that they must confront. W what do you mean by that? I mean, how specific can you be about that? Well, I think that we have, that the, the response to some of the kind of most pressing problems facing our society, what some people might call urban crisis, failing public schools, mass employment, et cetera, for the past half century has really been privileging punitive responses instead of really thinking about fundamental, more structural changes. And I think, you know, the war on poverty essentially provided low-income Americans, urban and rural, an opportunity for job training measures, an opportunity to receive remedial education, for skills building, homemaking, workshops, things like that. Instead, we need a job, we, we need job creation programs. We need a different and more kind of transformative, larger, broader response to these problems that go beyond um, punitive, punitive force, incarceration, surveillance, et cetera.